Next up, Galit Lahav. She's an associate professor of systems biology here at Harvard Medical School. She received her PhD in 2001 from the Department of Biology in Technion, Israel, the, at the Institute of Technology. Here at Harvard, her lab combines experimental and theoretical approaches to study how, tell, how cells talk to each other and to understand how cells go from one thing to another and more critically, how they make decisions, decisions that change or end our lives. Join me in welcoming Galit as she speaks about what cancer cells don't want us to know. So cancer cells are like killers. They're like criminals. They don't want to be caught, and as such, they have secrets. And our ability to discover those secrets depends on how we look at them, how we measure them, or how we spy them. And in this talk today, I would like to highlight two very simple but very important principles when studying cancer. The first is that we need to look at individual cancer cells, individual cancer cells. And the second is that we need to measure their behavior over time. And we'll zoom into each one of these and try to understand the importance of looking at these two using these very two simple principles. So let's start with the first one. We need to look at individual cancer cells. In order to demonstrate that, I would like to give you an example. Imagine that I ask you to calculate the average height of the people in this room. What would you do? You'll go and you measure the height of each individual, and then you'll calculate the average. Very simple. And you'll get a, a meaningful number. You'll get the average, the standard deviation, the distribution that represent the height of the people in the room. Now imagine that I ask you to calculate the average gender in the room. That's a bit more tricky, right? Why is that? Because gender is a binary property. You're either a man or a woman. You're either male or female, in most cases. <laughs> and so if we try to average binary properties, we get something in the middle that doesn't represent anyone in this room. And this can be extremely misleading. What's the connection between that and cancer? So most studies in cancer are done by averaging the assembled behavior, the collective behaviors of cells. We take a dish of cells with millions of cells, or cells from a patient or from an animal. We treat them with a drug, and we measure the average behavior. We get a single number. It's not the same situation as measuring the height of each individual and then calculating the average. We get one number that represents the average, and we have no idea what was the behavior of individuals. And this is extremely dangerous because, in some cases, the results could be misleading that could lead to wrong clinical decisions. So let's try to look at a few examples why this can be misleading. So imagine that you have three samples of cancers, and you want to test how these cancers react to three different drugs, drug one, drug two, and drug three. And the response to the drug is captured by the color here. Before the drug was added, they were yellow. And the more they respond to the drug, they become orange and then red. And so when we look at the average, we see that in all the three cases, cells started from the yellow color. And then in response to the three drugs, they became orange. So our conclusion is that in response to all these drugs, there is somewhat intermediate response. But if we have the ability to zoom into each of these cases and look at individual cells, we might discover that the um, situation is different between these three examples. And I'm drawing here just a few cells, but imagine that we have a dish of thousands or millions of cells. So in the first scenario, all cells behave exactly the same. They all became orange. They all have an intermediate response. So the average was, was correct. The average represents well the behavior of all the cells. In the second scenarios, Almost all the cells turn orange, but uh, one cell in the population stays yellow. And I see that the colors in the screen are a little different, but you can still see that there is one cell there that behaves different. And this can be extremely problematic in cancer treatment. There are lots of cases in which patients are treated with a drug. The treatment seems to be working, 
tumor, the tumor shrinks, but then there is a very small percentage of cells that do not respond to the drug, that are resistant. And these cells can later be, grow and become into new, uh, new tumors. And we are unable to capture these small percentage of cells if we're looking only at averages. This third example is even more dramatic, and this is exactly as the gender example. Half of the cells didn't respond to the drug, half of the cell had a full response to the drug. The average behavior is yellow, but not, is, is orange, but none of the cells actually showed us an orange behavior. So we got into a wrong conclusion based on the average. When we zoom into individual cell, we realize that the behavior is different, and it's very important to understand that by only by measuring this, we can learn something about the mechanism of action of this drug, and we can start to ask questions, why some cells respond, why others don't respond, and can we design new drugs that will treat all cells or push all cancer cells into uh, death or kill all cancer cells. So we need to look at individual cancer cells. Now let's look at the second very important principle. We need to measure their behavior over time. Why this is important. Let me give you um, an, an example unrelated to cancer. I have twins, um, a boy and a girl, and they're five years old. And a lot of people ask me, do they get along with each other? Are they good friends? And imagine that I ask you to help me answer this question by providing you one snapshot from their life. Aww. <laughs> so you look at this picture and you think, oh, they're such good friends. They look so loving and kissing. But this is just one snapshot. And if I'm going to show you the sequence of pictures that were taken right after this picture was taken, you would realize that the relationship is a bit more complicated. And so first there was some screaming, and then he pushed her. And here I actually had to drop the camera and stop the fight. Well, actually, there was one more picture which I decided not to show in case there is a social worker in the audience. But in any case, the point is that by looking at one snapshot, we can make the wrong conclusions. And only by looking at things over time, we see that things change. There is a change in the relationship, moving from loving and kissing into not so much loving and fighting. Exactly the situation for cancer cells. Let's bring our three experiments back into the room. We, need, we know we need to look at individual cells. Great, we look at individual cells. And again, we have the cells before we added the drug, they're yellow. After they added the drug, they become red, all of them responding. Now, let's see the three scenarios and what can happen over time. So in the first case, there was a gradual change. All the cells gradually turn into more yellow, orange, and then red. In the second case, there was a completely different behavior. This is, again, the binary property. Cells switch from non-responding into responding, and within time, more and more cells respond. The outcome is similar, but the way they reach there is completely different. And this third scenario, even the more extreme, cells originally respond, and then the response is reversible. And if response is not, locked, not like cell death, something reversible, this can obviously happen. So they switch from responding into non-responding and again. And one may wonder, why should we care? If the outcome is exactly the same in all these three examples, why should we care about how they got there? And we should, of course, care, because only by looking at the changes over time, we can understand how these drugs act on cells. We can ask questions why we get these different behaviors. We can learn about mechanisms. And only by looking on this basic mechanism, we can try, to, again, to develop better drugs, better combination of drugs that will push or kill all, all cancer cells. So how can we do that? How can we look at individual cancer cells over time? So the solution came from somewhat surprising place. Um, I grew up in Israel, in Haifa, which is a city close to the Mediterranean Sea. And I used to spend all my summers on the beach. That time, I was still quite naive, and I, I wasn't worried too much about the sun. But I worried about something else. And this was these creatures, animals. These were my biggest enemies. Um, and I remember when the jellyfish season started, it was the end of the world for me. 
And so when I became a scientist, it was a little bit surprising to realize that these animals are actually my best friends. <laughs> Jellyfish has a very unique gene, which is called, which encodes a green fluorescent protein. And so they glow in the dark. They look much prettier than how I remember them. And what we can do, we can take this green gene and put it anywhere we want. So what we, we create markers. We can follow the behavior of individual cells. So here is how it looks. This is an image taken in my lab in which we have lung cancer cells. And we took a gene called P53 and fused it to the green protein from the jellyfish. What is P53 in brief? Unfortunately, it's mutated in half of human cancer. But in the second half in which it's functional, researchers and clinicians are using P53 in order to kill cells. We hit cancer cells with radiation therapy or chemotherapy. P53 goes up and kills cells. So all you need to remember is that if cancer cells are the criminals, P53 is the police. And so what we do, we take this lung cancer cell, we use radiation therapy, and you'll see how P53 levels go up, 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 and then cells die. And you can perhaps um, zoom, zoom, pick one of the cells to follow, because basically they're all doing very much the same. So I'm going to play this movie. This is fluorescent movie taken with a fluorescent microscope. And you see they all become very green, 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 green. And then it looks like a video game. They all of them kind of dying. And that's great, because this is what we want. We want this kind of lung cancer cells to die in response to radiation therapy. But now if we take a different kind of cancer, these are breast cancer cells. Again, P53 is fused to a green fluorescent protein. And we irradiate them. We do radiation therapy. We see that the level of P53 goes up. Then it disappears. Then it comes back again. And they don't die. They stay alive throughout even several days. And if you watch carefully, they seem pretty happy. They, some of them even start to divide. But it's very obvious that this is different from what we've seen before. And so now, if we zoom into each individual cell and see what they're doing, we realize that this P53, the police, showing pulses of behavior. P53 goes up, then it goes down, goes up and goes down. It's like the police is coming and disappearing, coming and disappearing. And obviously, this is not an efficient way to find criminals or to discover criminals. And so these cells can survive. Now, there's no way that one could find these series of pulses if looking at the average. And there's no way that one could find these series of pulses if we look at one snapshot. We had to develop these tools in order to find these pulses of behaviors in this um, breast cancer cell line in response to radiation therapy. Do we care? Does it make any difference? So in a very recent study from my lab, we discovered that this makes a big difference. So cells that show these pulses of P53 were resistant to radiation therapy. They didn't die. They kept growing. And they as if they were not treated. They were resistant to the treatment. But we identified a combination of treatment, radiation therapy, together with a small molecule that changed P53 dynamics. And those cells stop growing, enter permanent cell cycle arrest, which also is a good outcome in cancer therapy. So only by looking at individual cells over time, we were able to identify the dynamics of P53 and to identify new treatment that can push cancer cells into permanent arrest. And I have one last slide in which I want to show you another example. And I, these are very recent data from my lab, so I won't be able to say the kind of cancer that we used here or the drug. But all I'm going to say is this is a widely common drug used in the clinic. And it's known that in some cases it works beautifully. In some cases, it doesn't work. We don't understand why. And so when we take cancer cells and treat them with these drugs, we see that half of the cells die and half survive. And again, we have no idea why. And when we look at P53, we see that in the dying cells, which are the red curves here, P53 comes up very fast. The police is coming fast, killing cells. But in the cells that are surviving, which are the green cells here, P53 also comes up but at a much later time point. And so this delay in P53 allow those cells to be resistant or to overcome the treatment. And we're trying to understand now why we see these differences in behaviors. Why does it take so long 
for the police to arrive in this case? And can we identify new treatments that will increase P53 levels fast in all cells and will kill all cells? So let me just summarize. What cancer cells don't want us to know? They don't want us to know that they're not all the same, that there's large variations between cells, and it's very important to look at their behavior at the individual cell level. And they don't want us to know that their responses can change, that they're highly dynamic and they can change over time, so we need to measure their behavior over time. Thank you. Great, great storytelling. Neil will be proud. You. Thank you. Um, if, uh, if this is an important set of insights, how quickly will we actually see this translate into what everyone does and how everyone measures? Um, it's a great question. In, in a way, you want everyone to use that or to, um, to use the same approach. Um, there's a challenge here. In order to be able to take those studies throughout all of these um, stages, you have to cross some disciplines. You have the genetics and the molecular biology to engineer the cells. You have the imaging to take those movies. But then you have to use computer science to do image analysis and image processing. You need to use statistical analysis to understand what you're measuring. You need mathematics in order to write models that capture the dynamics and suggest new ways to change the dynamics. So this is an extremely interdisciplinary uh, um, research, and I think we see more and more uh, places doing what systems biology, which is exactly mm -hmm. the idea of merging different disciplines. And so hopefully, I think within time, more people will add these disciplines into their research and we'll see more PhD programs that acquire, give students the ability to do both the math, the biology, the physics, and so on. And do you have a vision for the kind of clinical applicability of this over time? Absolutely. I think this is, um, at the end, this is, this is our mm -hmm. goal. And so what I've shown here is done on dishes of cells. We're trying, we're starting now a new collaboration in which we want to do the exact same thing in an animal using xenograft taken from human cancer. Um, and I think the more we understand about how these drugs act on different cancers, the more insights we will have that will then be translated into clinical applications. Yes. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. Thank we'll you. watch for this vision to come true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.